Welcome back to Films Retold. Today we are going to break down the Lexington letter that Apple released on Apple Books. The Lexington letter is meant to better build and develop a world of the Severance TV show. There will be timestamps in this video, so if you've already read the letter, you can skip to the end for the theories and discussion. If you haven't seen the series yet, I suggest you come back after watching it because there will be spoilers and we will be theorizing. If you enjoy this content, please remember to like and subscribe for more content like this. Okay, now let's start the letter. Hey Jim. I received a letter below from a severed employee at Lumen. I also scanned the employee handbook that she mentions in her letter here too, so that's attached. The whole thing seems pretty out there, but perhaps worth pursuing? Dear Miss Thorne. My name is Peg Kincaid. Until yesterday, I was an employee at Lumen Industries here in Topeka. I'm writing on behalf of myself and my friend, Peggy Kay, who is now no longer with us. Maybe it's strange to call her my friend, but it's how I think of her. Depending on how much you know about Lumen and what they do, maybe you already know what I mean. I chose to reach out to you because I've seen, among other things, your thorough coverage of the Domer truck incident on November 3rd. I thought about going to the cops with what I'm about to tell you, but people say Lumen has a lot of connections with the police and city hall and so I don't think they would believe me anyway. I hope you believe me. I really need someone to believe me. With that in mind, I'm going to try to give you the full story. Forgive me if I get a bit rambly, I tend to go on and on when I'm nervous. And I'm really very nervous about this. Right now, I'm staying in a motel because I can't shake the feeling that someone has been watching me. The same black cars seem to always be parked next to mine. And for the last few weeks, my mail has been all crumpled when I've gotten it at night, like someone's digging through it. It all feels so off. So yes, I just want to get this all written down, in case something happens. Something beyond what's already happened. Alright. Here goes, as a bit of background, I think, in your field, you call it color, up until about two years ago, I was a school bus driver for Clover Elementary down off Route 2. I'd been there for about 12 years. I loved my job. I love kids, even though I don't have any of my own. And I sincerely believe they liked me too. At some point, the kids learned that I was the youngest driver on the school's payroll, even though I was already 50, so they gave me the nickname Baby Driver, a reference to the beloved action film of the same name. But despite this fun camaraderie and my relative youth, I'll confess I was starting to feel burned out. My route had gotten longer, I had a few real misbehaviors, all that stuff. It all came to a boiling point one day in February. It was a cold day, the kind I used to call a booger freezer to get a rise out of the kids until a fundamentalist mom heard about it and complained. I was near the end of my afternoon route when, through no fault of my own, my bus hit black ice. I pumped the brakes, as per protocol, but our momentum kept us sliding and for the first time in my career in child transpo, I landed my rig in a ditch. All the kids screamed. I wanted to scream too, but you know how it is, gotta be the adult. Thank the good lord no one was hurt, just shook up. But we were stuck for nearly two hours, with the heat knocked out. The kids were crying, scared, cold, asking for their mommies. We had three urination events, which in the low temperature proved a real issue. Finally, another bus was able to come by and get my kids. I remained with the vehicle, again, protocol, and listened to the radio to try to stay warm. I don't know, it made sense at the time. Now this is the part that, when I look back, still makes me squirm. While I was sitting there waiting for the tow, bookers freezing, I distinctly remember thinking to myself, fuck this job. I may have even said it out loud, I'm not sure. But I either thought it or said it, and right at that moment, as if it had heard me, this ad came on the radio. It was an employment recruiting ad, but they were weirdly vague about the job. A lot of flowery talk about making history and rethinking the notion of work. I was sort of tuning out until the end when they said the name of the company, Lumen Industries. I knew who they were, I'd been using their deodorant since puberty but I didn't know they had a branch in Topeka. I remember thinking well, that was weird. Anyway, two hours later, the tow truck finally came and yanked my rig from the ditch. I got home five hours later than usual, with an angry voicemail from my supervisor accusing me of driving recklessly. I wasn't asking for a medal or anything, but a word of acknowledgement over the hell I'd just been through would have felt more appropriate than a chewing out. That night, I told myself I needed to start looking for a new job. I was off the next day, and I went downtown to run a few errands. On the way home, I passed what I realized must be the new Lumen site, which had been under construction for the past few months. It was a big building that looked almost like a mall. I thought back to when I'd heard their ad while shivering in that freezing bus. And even though I had ice cream in the trunk, I found myself turning into the parking lot. I parked, and I went in. At first I figured no high-tech company would hire someone like me. I mean, I only got through a few semesters at Kansas State. 
but the nice lumen lady who greeted me told me that didn't matter. She said that I could get a great office job, incredible benefits, manageable hours, and all I had to do was this tiny little procedure called severance. I'm guessing you know what that is. Well, I didn't remember, this was a few years back and it took them longer than it probably should have to explain it to me. They told me that after a screening process, I have a small, totally painless chip inserted into my brain. That freaked me out for a beat, but they assured me it was easier than getting a cavity filled. Then they told me that the chip would make it so I wouldn't remember work. That was the real benefit here, I have absolutely no memory of work. Never. I'd just go into the office and the chip would turn on in my brain, activating my work self my innie is what they called it. That person would do all the work. And then when I'd leave work, the chip would turn off, and I'd be back and have the whole rest of my day ahead of me. No memory of work and four times the pay? Despite it being quite a drastic procedure, all that made it feel like, well, a no-brainer. Or, huh, a half-brainer? Because of severance? You get it? Sorry. My dad always hated it when I joked when I was nervous, but here we are. So where was I? Right. Back to Lumen. I got the procedure, I was severed, all that, and it was totally fine. They even gave me a really nice four cheese panini afterward because my procedure time slot butted up against the lunch hour. I thought, this is so great. What a great place to work. I was wrong. Very very wrong. But I wouldn't learn that for another two years. I started at Lumen the following Monday and settled into this nice day-to-day -day routine. Swipe my fancy Lumen badge and then change out of my outdoor clothes and into some Lumen neutrals, as they call them, which means no labels, tags, patterns, no words at all, on anything. Company policy. Lumen wanted a complete divide between innies and us people on the outside, aka the outies. No written word, no messages back and forth were allowed, all of that is what you sign up for when you get severed. In my orientation, they even talked about these code detectors built into the elevators that would sense written words. It was a fancy place. Then, after changing my clothes, I'd take the elevator down to the severed floor in the basement and then, nothing. Sweet sweet nothing. In the middle of the elevator ride, my severance chip would switch my consciousness over to my innie, this whole other personality, with no memory of my life here in Topeka. She could walk and talk and all that, but didn't remember, say, my third grade teacher's name, or me falling off a horse and breaking my arm when I was eight, or when my ex-husband told me he wanted a divorce. Lucky girl. She was me, but not me. So yeah, my innie would wake up and head to work doing whatever it is my innie did down there. Some desk job with data, I'd been told. And meanwhile, the other half of the brain, that is, me, would basically get to just take a nap for the day. At the end of the workday, I'd come to, in that same elevator, maybe a little tired after what I assume was a hard day's work, but otherwise none the wiser for earning that paycheck. And that's how it went, day in and day out, for two years. Until one particular Tuesday, when I messed it all up. Or, actually, we messed it all up. That Tuesday, I got off work, in other words, I came to in that elevator, and went to my locker. Nothing odd there, but then, as I was pulling on my jacket, I felt something in my pants pocket, a surprise, since we're not supposed to bring anything in or out. I pulled out a half sheet of typing paper, neatly folded into pocket size. Seeing that the upstairs security guard was busy watching soccer on his phone, I opened it up. Now, at this point, I need to back up again and give you more color, but I promise it's for a very important reason. My sister Meryl is only about 11 months older than me. We actually were born in the same year, funnily enough. We've since grown apart as time's gone by, but as kids we were really close. In fact, we were so close that we invented a secret language together, called Puglish. We'd write long letters to each other about what boys we liked or teachers we hated in Puglish so no one else could understand. I say language, but actually, all we did was replace each letter with a different symbol. A was a seahorse. B was a lightning bolt. X was a pair of boobs, which got us in trouble once or twice, but not too often because it's an uncommon letter and we were sneaky. Anyway, like I said, Meryl and I had grown apart over time, and I hadn't thought about Puglish, let alone read or written it, for more than 30 years. So, on that Tuesday at Lumen, you can imagine my surprise when I unfolded the paper and found it lined with rows of little seahorses, lightning bolts, and other distantly familiar symbols. There was even a boobs in the second paragraph. I stood there, baffled at how a full note in perfect Puglish had ended up in my pocket while I was down on the severed floor. I took the note home and looked it over. It was strange how quickly my memory of our code came back to me, and I was able to read the message almost as if it had been in English. Understanding its contents proved a little harder. Dear Peggy K. I don't know what this language is, or why it's in my head. 
It's been coming to me slowly over the past few weeks. I find myself writing it at my desk. I thought if anyone would know what it was, maybe it would be you. I don't know if this will even pass the code detectors, but I felt I had to try. I know this is a breach in protocol. Please don't be angry with me. If you cannot tell, I am your innie. I live down here in the macro data refining department, with my three co-workers. I have often thought of you and what your life might be like out there, and why I exist in the first place. Why does one choose to get severed? Maybe this language isn't real and I'm writing nonsense. But if you can read this, I would love for you to write me back. I understand if that is not possible. I do not mean any harm. Sincerely, your innie, Peggy. Well, this knocked me on my ass, I'll be honest. I hadn't really given my innie too much thought before then. Like, I knew she was down there, doing her thing, but part of what I loved so much about this whole severance thing is that I didn't need to think about it. But then there she was, Peggy, my innie, writing to me. In Puglish. I stared at it for a long time. It also tripped me up because I hadn't been called Peggy since elementary school. I'd been told during training that my innie would be like a little kid, with little to no life experiences, but I didn't think it'd be so, obvious. I stared at that note for the rest of the night. I thought of her, or me, or a different version of me I guess, down there in the dark, on the severed floor, clearly desperate for more information. I was really torn about what to do. I loved my job, or what I knew about it, and I didn't want to mess that up. Writing messages to my innie was definitely against Lumen policy, there's no question about that. Was it possible a code invented by two grade schoolers could be enough to trick the detectors? Granted, it was a new technology, but still, to this day, a part of me wishes I'd done what I was supposed to, call my Lumen supervisor, Mr. Alvarado, and report my innie's infraction. But sometimes, at the end of the day, I come out of the elevator feeling, I don't know, different than I'd ever felt before. Maybe a little giddy or sometimes all wound up, or scared even, and it made me wonder, what were they doing down there with my body? So, the next morning, I decided to write her back just this once, and ask her. She wrote back right away, I got a message in my pocket that next night. She told me she worked as a macro data refiner. When I asked her what that means, she told me it involved working at a computer, putting these special numbers into special bins, which made no sense to me, that's a job. And I'm making four times as much as when I was driving a bus? Once the floodgates were opened, I couldn't help myself I wrote back to her more and more, asking follow-up questions. She responded with such a weird description that I had to write it down here, the best I've come up with is that the numbers make you feel things. It's not an individual number, but a whole cluster of them, and after a while, they'll sort of throb a certain emotion at you. Sometimes it's joy or sadness or worry. Sometimes it's obvious, other times more subtle. Each type of number has its own designation, like the angry ones are called M.A. Once you've identified the numbers, you surround them with the arrow on your computer and into a bin they go. I want to take a moment, Miss Thorne, and say that this sounded as nuts to me as it does to you. These numbers made her feel things? Peggy tried to help me out, and describe it more, but the more detail she'd go into, the more confused I got. I asked her if the numbers ever ended. She told me yes, when you finish a file. I guess there's a whole wall of them on her computer screen, but eventually, the wall runs out, and all the numbers have been sorted and that's that, file completed. Peggy told me that they get prizes when they finish the files, some weird stuff, like a melon bar and something called a music dance experience and a waffle party. It all sounded pretty infantilizing to me, but I hope they at least get different types of syrups to go along with those waffles. It wasn't always me drilling her though she also asked me things too. And over and over again, I was beside myself with how much it felt like I was talking to a kid version of, well, myself. She wanted to know everything about outside life, like what it felt like to be drunk, or asleep, I'd never thought of it before, but she'd never been asleep, because I'd do all that on the outside, or to fall in love, that one was a toughie to answer, just ask my ex-husband, or to have someone you love die. It was strange to see how the procedure filtered her knowledge. She knew what beer was but couldn't name a specific brand. She knew she lived in America but couldn't draw a map of it to save her life. She knew that movies exist, but not who David Niven was, despite him being by far my longest standing crush. It was like she'd seen only the vaguest shape of the world through a foggy window. She asked me what snow felt like, I sat on that one for a while and finally came up with holding a cold, cotton shirt that melts in your hands, and if I knew how to ride a bike. I do. Not very well, but I don't tip over either, and if I ever regretted getting severed. To be honest, I hadn't until I thought more about her sitting down there, in the dark. So anyway, yes, Peggy and I wrote these letters back and forth for, I don't know, maybe three or four weeks. Not every day but enough that it started to feel like, this sounds crazy, but like I'd found a new friend. 
She made me see my life in a different way. I used to think my life was boring, and pretty mundane, but Peggy found all the little details I'd mentioned fascinating, even glamorous. Once I painted my nails hot pink, which is really not my style, just to see what she'd think. That night, she wrote me back saying tears had sprung to her eyes, our nails were so beautiful. Sorry, I could go on forever. Like I told you, I ramble when I get nervous and I'm jumping out of my chair over here. No joke housekeeping just knocked on my motel room door and I shrieked. So anyway, me and Peggy kept thinking we'd get caught, but nothing seemed to come of it. Peggy grew concerned that their head of security, Mr. Dooley, a pale little man with a terrifying smile, was watching her more closely than usual. She described seeing him at the far end of the hall when she'd leave for the day, just standing there, smiling. Like he knew what I was doing but wanted to play with me a while before dragging me to the break room. I asked her what the break room was, but she never told me. Despite the forbidden nature of our whole interaction, this seemed to be a specific topic she was afraid to broach. Still, those co-detectors never seemed to bother us or pick up the puglish. If they had, I would have cut it off, played dumb, blamed my own idiocy, and never Peggy's, but it never happened. But then we get to that morning of Friday November 3rd, which is why I'm writing to you in the first place. I come to in the elevator as usual that night and check my pockets, just like I've been doing for months, and there's another note from Peggy. And she's really excited. She finished her file, which was named Lexington, earlier that afternoon, at 2.30 p.m. She says she's been so excited to tell me about it that she could barely wait to go home, even if it meant cutting her melon bar party, short. She told me that the Lexington file had been extra complicated and particularly exhausting to do, this made sense to me, I'd felt fried for the last few weeks after coming to in the elevator and didn't know why. She said she'd pushed through and completed it and that everyone at Lumen, including her boss and her boss's boss, was thrilled with her work. They'd even given her an extra melon bar party to cash in later in the week. Whoopee, right? Again, I don't fully get this whole refining files thing, but a big win at work makes me look good too, so what the hell? And our whole body just felt jazzed when I came to in the elevator, which wasn't a bad feeling either. I drove home and went for a jog for the first time in weeks. I felt like I could tackle the world. Later that same night, I'm watching TV and I see you, Miss Thorne, on the news. Your face was as serious as I've ever seen it, your voice steadfast and resolute as you reported about the truck that had been blown up in New York at 2.32 p.m. that day. The Domer Therapeutics truck. Domer, of course, is a major competitor of my now former employer Lumen. God, watching that footage made my heart stop. Seeing bystanders running for cover, the destroyed street, all of it seemed like hell. That's when a sudden, intrusive thought dumped the hard knot right into the pit of my stomach. I looked back at my earlier note from Peggy, and read again when she'd completed the Lexington file. The time had been 2.30 p.m. Two minutes before the bomb went off. I was stunned. I tried to tell myself I was being paranoid, but I couldn't stop the thoughts from coming. Two people were burned alive in a truck. Four others were dead, too. No explanation, no terrorist group claiming credit. The next day, Domer said that some of their devices had been destroyed. Their prototypes or whatever. It almost seems like this was some kind of corporate espionage. It all seems like too much of a coincidence, doesn't it? Is that why these numbers are making the innies down there feel things? Because they're dropping bombs or blowing things up from down there. What had I gotten my body, and my innie, my friend, into? I barely slept that weekend. On Monday morning, I wrote Peggy another note, asking her to send me any information she could about the file she'd just refined. Told her it was super important. She didn't know anything about the Domer truck down there, of course, but I tried to press her more about the numbers. I asked her, what do her bosses tell her about the numbers? About Lexington in particular? What is this data they're refining? Not much, she said, other than it being very important work. Finally, I worked up the nerve to tell her about the truck. It took me over an hour to write that note. I told her I couldn't be sure there was a connection, but that the timing felt too close to ignore. I told her not to refine another number down there, no matter the consequences. I told her that, if I was right, then Lumen had been using us both for something insidious and horrifying. I told her none of this was her fault. And that I loved her. I didn't hear back. A day passed, then three. Every day I went down, hoping to feel the familiar pressure of a note in my pants pocket as I came back up. But there was nothing. Was she mad at me? Horrified by my claim? Or was it something else? Was there something stopping Peggy from responding? It's a funny thing, worrying about your innie. I was leaving each day without a scratch on me, and I was certainly still alive, which meant that physically Peggy had to be fine. But her silence every evening grew more terrifying as the days turned to weeks. I wanted to write her again, 
ask what was going on, but was Luminon to us. If so, another note could spell disaster for my dear friend. One Tuesday, I emerged to find my hair wet. A note on my windshield from Lumen informed me that my E had had a visually comedic but painless mishap with a water cooler. I was given a gift card to Murray's all-day breakfast buffet as an apology for the inconvenience. That night, over hash browns, my mind raced. What the hell were they doing to her down there each day? How could I help? Should I resign? Since Lumen was the only place she was alive, quitting would essentially mean killing her. Surely, I couldn't do that, no matter how bad things had gotten. It was two weeks later when, upon ascending for the evening, I felt something thick and firm tucked in the back of my waistband. I struggled to show no emotion as I went to my locker, retrieved my personal items, and went out to my car. When I was safely off Lumen property, I breathlessly pulled it out and saw a faded, spiral-bound booklet with a teal cover marked the Macro Data Refiner's Orientation Booklet. A note was taped to the front, written in the King's English in my very own handwriting. Duly found your last note. Been in break room. Don't know how long. Think you're right about Lexington. Lumen updating code detectors but they're down today. Hope this booklet gives clarity. Be careful. I love you too. I opened the booklet and was startled to find an eerily chipper creature smiling up at me from the page. He looked, pardon my indelicacy, like a little dildo with translucent skin revealing a spiral-shaped digestive tract leading down to his anus. After reading his intro, I learned that this was Sevi, a personified Severin's chip and the internal mascot Lumen uses to train its innies. Describing this document is probably a fool's errand, so I'm enclosing it here for you to look at too. I've spent hours going over it, trying to decipher what the numbers might mean, as explained by the all-knowing Sevi. Maybe you can figure out more, cause to me this whole thing feels like it was written for a child. That's all you'll tell me about what all this stuff means? The only thing the handbook says about it is, we know you may be curious about what the numbers mean. However, knowing the true meaning behind the numbers could inhibit your natural intuition. Well, my natural freaking intuition is telling me something horrible is happening here. After that, I didn't hear from Peggy for a week. I didn't write anything either, worried that Lumen's updated code detectors would be able to read Puglish and I'd land her back in the break room, which I could tell by now wasn't a fun place with beanbag chairs and a pinball machine. This brings us to last Friday morning. I sat in my car in the Lumen lot, trying to mentally prepare for my strange daily descent, and wondering what horrors the day held for my dear Peggy. For some reason, I thought of that moment on the bus, skidding across the ice with the kids screaming behind me. Knowing I was responsible for whatever was going to happen to those children in the coming seconds. As their screams rang in my head, I did something that contradicted my better judgment. I grabbed a fast food receipt out of my cup holder and hurriedly wrote a note in Puglish. It was a very quick note. All it said was are you okay? I went into work and descended in the elevator as usual, trying not to look nervous as I went down. When I came back up, my heart was racing, my palms were sweaty, though of course I didn't know why. More troublingly, I felt a dry clump of something in my mouth. I looked at my watch, 9:10 a.m. Only 10 minutes had passed since I'd gone down. Trying to look casual and avoiding eye contact with a security guard, I made a beeline for my locker. There, I deftly spat out the object in my mouth, which I found was a wadded up sheet of paper. Unable to wait, I opened it and read. Peg. Leave now. Get somewhere safe. They will try to follow. Nothing they say is real. Distribute the training booklet. Answers are there if you look. Thank you for my life. You were the best part of it. I'll be with you always. Peggy K. And that was it. I called Mr. Alvarado and quit on the spot. I left Topeka without returning home. I only wish I could talk to Peggy again, tell her that I was going to get help for her and for all the severed people down there, and that somehow, somehow I'd get the word out about what Lumen is doing. That attack killed six people, and I can't even begin to tell you why, even though I may have been the one, or two, who pulled the trigger. But the thing that hurts the most is the only way I could ever talk to Peggy again is to go back to Lumen to switch my severance chip back on, and I can't do that again. Not ever. So instead, here I am, writing to you. I considered putting this up on social media, but I have about 16 friends on there, including my ex-husband, and figured you could get the word out faster than all that. I hope so anyway. For me and for Peggy. Thank you for your time, Miss Thorne. I look forward to hearing from you as soon as possible. My cell is 785-555-4332. Please hurry. Very sincerely. Peg Kincaid. Hey Daria. Read through this letter. Interesting stuff but all, as you said, pretty out there. I don't think we have the resources right now to put you on this type of story. 
Besides, seems more like a disgruntled employee making stuff up. I called over to a source I trust implicitly at Lumen and it sounds like she was let go because of too many absences. Let's have you focus on the high school basketball playoffs, as discussed. Thanks. Jim. You're sure? I can still file that story and then move on to this. These allegations, if true, are pretty astonishing. Too late anyway. Just saw this, from Carolyn over in Obits. Margaret Peg Kincaid, 54. Peg Kincaid passed away from complications from a car accident on November 11. She is survived by her sister, Meryl Rasmussen, of Tacoma, Washington, and a group of supportive and loving friends throughout the Topeka, Kansas area. A dedicated school bus driver for several decades, Peg enjoyed bridge, spy novels, gardening, cats, and David Niven films. She will be missed by all who knew her. A memorial service will be on November 20 at 10 a.m. In lieu of flowers, please consider a donation to the Topeka Humane Society. Tough break. Sorry. Not to sound too harsh here, but all this might be for the best, her whole letter felt really loose and it's not like we want to get into a libel suit with Lumen. You may remember what happened with the Nashville Tribune when they printed what they thought was a well-sourced expose on Lumen's feeding tube devices, they got sued into oblivion and folded six months later. Please send me those basketball pages ASAP though. I want to run them in tomorrow's edition. Jim Milchik, Editor. The Topeka Star. So let's summarize what we just read. Daria T. is a reporter who works for the Tobacco Star. She was sent this letter and the Lumen handbook by a woman named Peg. Peg claims to have worked at Lumen and believes what Lumen is doing to severed employees is what caused the attack on one of Lumen's competitors killing several people. This letter is forwarded over to a man named Jim Milchek, who is the editor for the news agency. This is not the same Milchek from the TV series because his name is actually Seth Milchek, not Jim. Jim Milchek may be a brother or a son to the Seth Milchek that we know. This would explain why Jim was so fast asked to dismiss the story, and he does mention that he knows someone high up in Lumen. We also learn that Lumen has other buildings in the United States that operate with severed employees. The TV series makes us believe the Egan influence has mostly been aggregated into the town that they live in, but now we know that Lumen may have more power and influence than we originally thought. We also learn that the code detecting scanners are not as perfect as implied in the show, although Any Peg does say that they were being upgraded. Something to note though, the last message Audi Peg gave to her any self was written on a receipt, which you would think would have regular writing on it, such as numbers or a description of the items bought. This happens after the scanners were upgraded, and a whole 10 minutes have passed before she exits the elevator again. In that time, Any Peggy managed to get back into the elevator and with the note in her mouth without security noticing. This gives us more hints that either the scanners are not real, or they're not as as effective as the higher-ups would like the Indies to believe. This lines up with episode 6 where Seth Milchek visits Dylan to see if he snuck the card out of Lumen. If the scanners truly were upgraded or even worked at all, Milchek would have known the card was still in the Lumen building and not have risked activating any Dylan while he was at his Audi's home. Another important thing mentioned is the fact that any peg says that the Perlish language has been coming back to her slowly. Not that she already knew it, but almost like she's remembering it. I have a feeling this has something to do with Audi Peg and her sister creating the language when they were kids. Kids have been symbolic throughout the whole show so far. We constantly hear that the innies are like kids with a clean slate, but that might not actually be the case. I gotta be honest, I never expected the writers to drop so much new information on us through this promotional content. All the secrets and clues being left behind is a genius way to market the show. But anyway, those are my thoughts and theories on this. Drop me a comment and let me know what you think about everything. I'm going to be doing a part 2 covering the Lumen Handbook itself to see if we can make any connections from there. But as always, thanks for watching, and if you enjoy this content, subscribe and like the video. Thanks.